Okay, so here we have a photon, the energy of which you now know how to calculate. And we're just going to express it as this sort of particle that's got this wave phenomenon. Now the question is this, what is it that plants do with that photon? Now remember, the first law of thermodynamics says that energy can't be created or destroyed, which means that whatever we do with a photon, we have to take that energy from that photon and do something with it. We can't just make it disappear. However, the photon can disappear. And that's exactly what plants do. Plants absorb photons, take the energy from them, and use that energy to power a series of reactions that we call the light dependent reactions. Those light dependent reactions literally transfer the energy from the photon onto chemical potential energy in the form of ATP and this other molecule, NADPH which is very similar to a molecule that we've already seen. It's, if you remember from the previous lecture, we looked at NAD, nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. This is precisely the same thing, except it has a phosphate group on it, an extra phosphate group. So this series of reactions is, is just the start of photosynthesis. We actually take that energy and use it to make ATP and NADPH. We then take that energy in the form of chemical potential energy, ATP and ADPH, and feed that into another series of reactions, which we call the light independent reactions, sometimes called the dark reactions, which I don't really care for because it, they don't necessarily occur in the dark. But the light independent reactions then use that energy from the ATP and the ADPH to literally make organic compounds out of inorganic compounds. So this is the synthesis step. And what they then create is typically sucrose, which is not the sugar that's in your blood. Your blood has glucose in it. Sucrose is table sugar. We get table sugar from plants, which is why it is that we use sucrose instead of glucose in our coffee and so forth. But this photosynthate doesn't have to just be sugar. From the sugar, we can build essentially all organic compounds. And what I'm about to show you is that this is a little bit misleading. This is how it's taught in the textbooks. I find it a little more insightful, though, to realize that the photosynthate is not really a sugar. What the photosynthate is, is glyceraldehyde 3-phosphate, G3P, the exact same thing that we saw in the uh, middle of glycolysis. So what we want to do then is to understand first these light dependent reactions, then look at the light independent reactions, and see exactly how it is that we build all these organic compounds. Both sets of reactions occur inside the cell in an organelle that you've probably heard of. It's called a chloroplast. It's one of the organelles that defines the plants because in it, it has an inner membrane, very much like the inner membrane of the um, mitochondria. And it has attached to that inner membrane these other uh, membranes that are called thylakoids. And the thylakoids form these stacked like discs that are called grana. The stack is called a grana. And or granum, and these uh, membranes have in them the pigments and the machinery that drives essentially both the light and dark reactions, or light independent, light dependent reactions. If we look specifically at that thylakoid membrane, you'll see that in it there is a system of pigments that will ab absorb photons that are impinging on that membrane. So the photons will come along in here and they'll hit the pigment. And in particular, what happens is the pigment has an electron that the photon will interact with. So the photon hits it, hits the electron. The electron then is boosted to a higher energy state. And that's the step, that's the exact step where electromagnetic energy is transferred into chemical potential energy. Now, there's a lot going on here. This whole thing, this antenna system that's embedded in that thylakoid membrane uh, has this transition state that will allow the electron that gets excited to move to a particular uh, uh, center, what we call the reaction center, of that antenna system. And it's that electron that ultimately drives the light dependent reactions. Because once you get that electron into a higher energy state, it can then go through an electron transfer, an electron transport, just like we saw in the mitochondrion. So this is how it works. Here's that thylakoid membrane, and embedded in the thylakoid membrane are a series of these antenna pigment systems. And the first one we're going to talk about is called P680. It's called that because it uh, absorbs maximally at 680 nanometers. And it's embedded in a big protein complex that we call a photosystem. And there's a number of photosystems. There's one and two, which we're going to talk about. 
And we're going to start with Photosystem 2. We're not starting with Photosystem 1 for historical reasons. Photosystem 1 was discovered first and was associated with something else and so on. So we're going to start, though, in our concept with Photosystem 2 because that's really where the electron transport chain begins. So here we have our antenna pigment system. And the photons come in and impinge on that antenna pigment system. They get absorbed by the electron, send the, boost the electron to a higher energy state. And now that they're at the high energy state, they can go through an electron transport chain very, very similar to what we saw in the mitochondrion. In fact, what happens then is once they're on that, uh, uh, once they're in that excited state, they then start participating in a bunch of redox reactions on photosystem two, which then donates them to another molecule called plastoquinone, PQ here, which then donates it to a cytochrome, just like the cytochrome that we saw in the uh, in the mitochondrion which then donates it to this other thing called plastocyanin, or PC. And so the electron transport chain does essentially exactly what we saw in the mitochondrion. Now, if you remember the mitochondrion, the whole purpose of this was to take this high energy electron and use its energy to pump hydrogen ions across this membrane. That's precisely what we're going to do. But I'm going to talk about something else before we get into that, because there is a nuance, and there's something that's very different here than we saw in the mitochondrion. So again, here's another opportunity for you to use that concept of compare and contrast. Here we have an electron transport chain system which is very similar to what we saw in the mitochondrion, but there are nuances and there's differences. To keep both of those things straight, it's a good idea to study by doing a compare and contrast sort of project. Compare the uh, electron transport chain that you're seeing here in the thylakoid with the electron transport chain that you saw in the mitochondrion, and then contrast it. List every way in which they're similar that you can think of. List every way in which they're different. Every way. Again, it's not just a few. Do as many as you possibly can, and then you'll be ready for the exam. Okay, so here we have a standard sort of electron transport chain. Not a lot of differences except for the names of some of these compounds, some of these, these complexes. But there's this other photosystem right here, P700 on photosystem 1. And again, called 700 because it absorbs maximally at 700 uh, nanometers. Now, this whole process here, if you remember, the electrons, once they get to this point here, are at a low energy state. Now here's a difference between what happens in the mitochondrion and what happens here in the thylakoid. In the mitochondrion, those two electrons end up where? Okay, now you should be able to answer that. I'm not going to answer it for you. You should be able to answer it. Where do those electrons end up when they're at the low energy state at the end of the chain? Here, these electrons are not going to go there. These electrons are going to go here to P700. The problem is, P700 has no space for them. So what haps, has to happen first is that another photon has to come in here and excite, oxidize P700. It excites two electrons. Actually, it's not one photon, it's two. But two photons come in here, excite two electrons, and those electrons then move down another electron transport chain, which I'll talk about in just a moment. But once this has been oxidized, once P700 has been oxidized, now there's space for low energy electrons at the end of the other P680 photosystem 2 electrons. So they then get donated to replace those two electrons that were oxidized off of P700. So that's the electron transport chain, except it's now two coupled electron transport chains. Two electrons by two photons move down this electron transport chain and go here to P700. Now I've made a, a slight simplification here which is a little bit misleading and I want to make sure that we're clear. It isn't that one photon knocks two electrons out. It isn't that two photons knock two electrons out at the same time. The electrons don't travel together. They travel sequentially. And so one electron goes down, another one electron goes down. It is a constant flow of electrons here that go through these uh, complexes that are generating all of the, uh, the energy. Okay, so all we're doing here is harvesting the light. That's all this is showing, is how the light is harvested. But now we also have to account for the electrons. Notice P680 has been oxidized. The electrons have left. Now we know how P6, P700 gets oxidized and then re-reduced, but the question then remains, how is it that P680 gets reduced? In other words, we've lost two electrons here. It's been oxidized. We need to find two low energy electrons to replace the two electrons that got, that got excited by the photons. So where can we find two low energy electrons? Well, again, we look for a compound, we look for an element that has a high electronegativity. Upper right hand corner, blah, 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 like we saw before, oxygen is again our, our, our baby. We're going to be able to get a low energy electron or two low energy electrons off of oxygen. 
the most common source of oxygen is not free oxygen in the atmosphere, and that would be hard to get the electrons off of that anyway. The most common source of oxygen on this planet is water. So that's where we're going to get the electrons. We're going to get the, off the oxygen of water. Now here is the water, and what we need to do is break it down. So we need to rip off these two hydrogens, rip the electrons off the hydrogens, and use those to replace the two electrons that were oxidized off P680. Problem is, water is a very stable compound, so it's at a very low energy state. In order to get water to break apart, we need an energy source because breaking water apart is an endergonic reaction. The energy source that we can use is the same energy source we've been harvesting. In this case, it's just light. So what the, what the plant uses is this. It uses another photon, and that photon literally breaks this water molecule apart, releases the two protons, takes the two electrons off of that, and puts that onto the P680, and we're then releasing oxygen, free oxygen. And that's the oxygen that you breathe. That's where it's coming from. Essentially all of it. The oxygen is made from water by plants during this photosynthetic step to replace the electrons that get oxidized off P680. All right, so that's how the energy from light is harvested. That's how the electrons are all accounted for. There's one other thing we have to do, and that's to account for the electrons that were oxidized off P700. And then we have to see, okay, well, the whole purpose of this is to basically capture that energy in the form of ATP and NADPH. So how do we do that? That's our next step.